Let's talk about the skull today. Perhaps it's one of the most complex but most beautiful parts of a human skeleton. The skull is composed of multiple bones and in this video we're going to present the skull in general with names of all the bones that are forming it, dividing it first into bones of the cranial skeleton and then saying a couple of words about bones that form the facial skeleton. The cranial skeleton is composed of eight fairly large bones and most of them could be seen from the skull surface with exception of ethmoid bone that is situated deep inside the nasal cavity practically squeezed tight between two halves of the frontal bone. The cranium itself is composed of the following bones. Let's remove the mandible so it will be easier for me to handle the skull starting with the forehand which is composed of a single bone that is called the frontal bone. Earlier during the fetal development frontal bone develops from two halves however the suture between two halves closes quite early and that's why on most of the adult skulls it is not even noticeable as a trace of a suture which used to be there. Further posterior to the frontal bone we will find left and right parietal bones. I love to see the parietal bones from the above. This is the left-sided, this is the right-sided parietal bone because only from this superior view one can notice that there is pretty much a nice and quite massive enlargement within parietal bones. This is essentially what accounts for a biparietal diameter which is measured on the fetal head determining whether the birth could be happening naturally or there is a need for eventual inducing the c-section because there is discrepancy between size of the infant's head and the size of maternal birth canal. Those prominent spots on the parietal bones are called tubers of the parietal bone and they actually recognize as the center where the primary ossification of the bone started happening. Left and right parietal bones are united with each other using this quite complex and quite intriguing connection between two bones which is known as the sagittal suture and then in turn left and right parietal bones will also connect through the suture to the frontal bone however this time the suture is called the coronary suture or frontal suture. At the intersection between coronary and sagittal suture in early infancy we would have a little bit of a residual fibrous connective tissue practically being sized two by two centimeters and that residual of connective tissue is known as the greater fontanelle. It is slowly shrinking in size and around first birthday it is expected to fully close and therefore would not be possible to explore it through palpation. Going further posteriorly from parietal bones and still visible tubers of the parietal bone we are now arriving at the back of the skull. Yet another quite prominent suture is going to be observed in this area of the skull. It is called the lambdoid suture and it is formed between the most posterior and most inferior bones of the cranial skeleton, the occipital bone versus left and right sided parietal bones. Intersection between sagittal and lambdoid suture was yet another site for appearance of this time smaller fontanelle. It is about one by one centimeter and its closure is expected to be a little earlier around six months of life it will be fully replaced by bone and continued formation of the lambdoid and the rest of the sagittal suture will ensue. Let's turn the skull to the side so on the top of these four bones that we previously encountered now we can see the lateral aspect of the skull we can still follow the rest of the coronary suture which turn out to be a little bit more posteriorly located compared to what many people imagine it to be. One of the common mistakes is that the coronary suture practically coincides with a hairline which is not correct it is far more posteriorly positioned than the hairline. The lateral side of the skull illustrates the temple 
and here is a bone which definitely dominates the picture that is the temporal bone. Temporal bone with multiple features it has like a mastoid process, external auditory canal and also the zygomatic process that will ensure that temporal bone will meet the zygomatic forming pretty big and massive temporozygomatic arch. Deep inside the temple if we come a bit closer we're going to find another bone with only minor part projecting into a temple that is the sphenoid bone. Sphenoid bone is seen bilaterally because it has a central position within the skull and many authors consider it to be like a keystone bone of the cranial compartment. Keystone because it makes the contact with all other bones of the cranial compartment directly. This is the greater wing of the sphenoid bone which is as you can see here forming another suture with the frontal bone, with the parietal bone and with the squama of the temporal bone. This area is generally known as the pterion and pterion uh, practically coincides with the base of the skull. Just a little bit further down is the base of the skull and uh, we will take a look at the base of the skull in one of the videos to follow. By introducing the sphenoid bone we actually came to last bone, bone 7 because temporal bone exists also bilaterally. Sphenoid bone is a single bone and let's try to identify position of the last bone of the cranial compartment which is known as the ethmoid bone. The skull that is currently available for recording of this part unfortunately has nasal bones being damaged however it is quite convenient for us for this moment because we're trying to locate the position of the ethmoid bone. So if we zoom in with a camera and try to get deep into a nasal cavity we're going to find multiple parts that belong to ethmoid bone and ethmoid bone itself is responsible for a variety of different structures within a nasal cavity. One of them would be to form together with the vomer, nasal septum which will divide nasal cavity into left and right halves. Also its large projections known as the superior and middle nasal conhe or turbinates will also create a bit of extra ridges and crests within the nasal cavity forcing air as it moves through to actually take a little bit more turbulent run than to move in a straightforward linear direction. So with the zoom we can see here deep inside the nasal cavity parts of the ethmoid bone and it is as you can see very close to both orbits left and right and it has been very neatly housed between left and right halves of the frontal bone. On a different skull which has the skull cap removed we would be able to see a little bit more of the ethmoid bone and we will use a different skull for presentation of ethmoid by itself.